This is a picture of uh, one of the Bitcoin <laughs> cryptocurrency mines that I've got. It's just north of Atlanta, so a nice little drive down this morning. Um, started this about two and a half years ago, and uh, a lot of people ask, and I talk about mining quite a bit, but why even do cryptocurrency mining? Um, first of all, it can be really profitable. Typically, if you buy a piece of mining equipment, like this thing right here, right now I have it mining Ethereum Classic because that's what those cards are optimized for. Um, it's probably uh, generating about somewhere between eight and ten dollars per day of Ethereum Classic, and it uses about fifty dollars of electricity per month. Uh, and the box itself, all the cards, everything costs about three thousand dollars. So my rule of thumb is, you know, you buy a piece of gear, it pays itself off probably in about 10 to 12 months, and you can use it for another year or two after that, and you can probably sell the parts 20 to 30% of what you bought them. If you have been in business, and you can come across a business that's 100% annual return on investment, I mean, good businesses are 15%. Now that's outstanding growth rate. So, possibility of 100% growth, I'm like, just got to jump into it. Um, I let you buy cryptocurrency at a discount, dollar cost averaging, a little bit every day. Uh, it's kind of a fun hobby for a computer guy like me. Uh, keeps me out of trouble. And uh, oh, so I heard about this new cryptocurrency that the guy uh, who was the head of Overstock.com, uh, Patrick Byrne, he was talking about this new cryptocurrency called Raven. And uh, you can't buy it on exchange. But I got five of my GPU miners that have been mining Raven for the last month. So if it ever turns into value, I've got Raven. And I'll be able to. I don't know why you thought it was important. But, Is it you know, Raven Protocol? Uh, that might be it, Raven Protocol, yeah. something like that. They're out of Hong Kong. Oh. Yeah. Okay, well, well, I got some. <laughs> 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 you can't buy it on exchange, really, but, well, you can get it over the counter. All right, so a lot of people, when Bitcoin pricing is really high, I, I, I run a, a blog website where I teach people how to do Bitcoin and cryptocurrency mining. And before I, when I looked into this, I looked into the first Bitcoin, started reading about it maybe five years ago, but I didn't do anything about it because I owned a different business and I didn't really have time. Um, and then I started, I think about two and a half or three years ago. And um, I started by buying that, that miner up top, that's a Bitmain Antminer uh, S7. I don't ship those anymore because they're old. But I bought one, I started running it. And I did the numbers on it and figured out how much I was making. I'm like, wow, this thing will pay for itself in about 10 months. And so then I started trying to extrapolate the hash rate growth and the price growth and everything else. I'm like, nah, this won't make any money. Uh, and, and every time I do a calculation on mining and try to project it in the future, I'm like, no, nah, it doesn't, it won't make any money. But then I buy more miners and they make me money. So I'm like, well, I guess my calculations are wrong. Sometimes simplistic modeling can't really model what the real world is like. And, and so I just keep buying more and more. Um, these are. This one's an especially quiet miner. This is a graphic processing unit card miner. Uh, and I'll explain how that works in a little bit. Uh, so I rented a small 1,500 square foot face, space. Uh, there's a lot of roll-up door spaces. Uh, I decided I, I needed cooling because um, that thing puts out about 1,000 watts of heat. And so take a, imagine taking a hair dryer that's maybe 1,000 or 1,500 watt and turning it on and putting it on the bathroom counter and closing the door and then never turning that hair dryer off. And in my larger space, I've got about 450 of those. Uh, so it takes a lot of cooling to, uh, to get them uh, out and going. Uh, so what I recommend to people that are interested, just buy a miner. Go to Amazon and buy one and get it shipped to you right away. Or go buy directly from a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And just the process of running one miner will teach you so many different things. You need to find a wallet. You need to figure out what mining pool to hook your miner up to. After you start mining and get cryptocurrencies, then you got to figure out what to do with it. You're like, great, I've got cryptocurrency. What do I do with it now? You got to figure out some kind of exchange to send to it. And, and there's all sorts of things you'll learn by just doing one mine. Um, and then I always say start with, a, with an algorithm leader. So the, the people that created an algorithm, there's lots of different things to mine. You don't have to just uh, mine Bitcoin. And um, yeah, it takes a lot of cool. We'll talk about that a little bit. So, all right, so I started by buying these pre-made boxes from Bitmain, uh, and then I started stacking them up. And the little space that I rented was um, in the middle of a, a bunch of other industrial spaces, and I got 200 amps at, at 240 volts. 
in and I'm like, all right, start plugging in miners, got an electrician in there. Then about 30 miners were plugged in and the big breaker for the building, or for, sorry, for my part of the building opened up. And uh, all right, well, I guess I hit my limit. I can't put more than 30 miners into this place. And so the way I like to get into something is to learn a little bit and then just jump in and start doing it. Because uh, if, if you go take a course on it, courses um, are usually about five to 10 years behind the state of the art on business. What Rob's teaching I, I here yeah. is about two, <laughs> Rob's teaching here is about two to three years behind state of the art. Uh, and if you get into business and uh, someone like me talks about what I'm doing, it's probably about what I was doing six months or a year ago. I'm not going to share what I'm doing right now, <laughs> but it'll get you closer. And so the old, the real way to get into uh, in, in figuring out what's going on right now. Uh, is just to jump in and, and start doing it. And when you jump in and start doing it, there's a lot you don't know. So you have to be okay with looking like a fool. And I'm okay with that. Um, so I, I, I did all sorts of things wrong. Um, and, and then I, I called an electrician and I'm like, hey, can we get more electricity in here? And the power company's like, yeah, sure, we can bring a new transformer right up to the building. Uh, then it would have cost $80,000 to run the electrical cables through the building to where I was. And since I was renting the space for about $1,100 a month, I'm like, that's not really worth it. And so then I had to go find an entirely different building to move into if I wanted to expand. So, but at least I had learned something. Uh, and oh, in this upper right corner, that was the first graphic processing unit miner, GPU miner that I built. Uh, there was nobody that would actually put designs on the internet on how to do that. This was the one design I could find. And it was a horrible design because it kept overheating and the GPU cards kept burning out and I had to send them back for warranty replacement. So here's a picture of a miner that I'll build these days. You can see it's just like this one here. It's got like space between them for heat and it's got six graphics cards instead of three. Um, but, you know, at least I started and I learned how to set up graphic GPU miners and, and there's really not a lot of information. So I have how to's on uh, how to build graphic miners, and then I started, because uh, I owned a business previously, I started talking about how to run mining as a business and different things and did some YouTube videos. So I'll do a video every few months and um, I hope they get some views. So I am fortunate that I've got some different experience that helps me on this kind of stuff. Uh, I've got my education at the Naval Academy, electrical engineer, and then I went to the Navy nuclear power program, which was one of the first, had the first operating nuclear power plant in the world, the Nautilus submarine. And then I was uh, uh, helped run a nuclear power plant on a submarine out of Hawaii for about four years. So we got some decent experience there with power and electricity and stuff like that. Um, and then, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> got out of the Navy and entered the business world, which is a whole education in itself. Worked for Cisco Systems, a big data networking company, quit that and started a business back in 2002 yeah, to do uh, actually See that access point up there? That's the Cisco access point, I believe. We did that in colleges and universities all, all over Georgia. Uh, all, there's 30 technical colleges, there's 30 border region schools. So we put in network, Wi-Fi, uh, Cisco voice over IP phone systems. I don't see a phone system here. But basically built a, a business, started on credit cards, had about 60 employees back in 2014 when I sold it. So um, I just like to, I, I like to teach people how to do stuff. Um, Oh, yeah, that's my son. He's uh, 15 now, so he drives me around. He's got his learner's permit. <laughs> no, he, he's built about 30 of these miners. Before he started, he liked computers. Uh, I think he still likes computers. Uh, but he's also learned how to build these. And the building's the easy part. Getting it running and troubleshooting it when it doesn't work is kind of the hard part. But he's now developed a troubleshooting methodology. And uh, we can do that. And it was like... About a year and a half ago, I'm like, all right, you've done a lot of work. So I paid him a Bitcoin, which I think it was at the time. And then I taught him how to get on Poloniex and how to lend it out, which you could do back then. And he bought some bit shares and bought some other stuff. Uh, so he was doing position trading and all sorts of stuff like that. And I've been mining for a while now. And so my wife's into it. So everywhere we go, uh, she's like, hey, do you take Bitcoin? Because <laughs> put so much money into mining that we have a lot of Bitcoin now. But that's and other stuff like that. Um, all right, so what does a miner need? So if you get started with one miner, that's great. 
And if you want a few more miners, you might be able to plug them into your house. If you've got free electricity, I don't know if you're in a student house or anything like that, you can plug this in and run it in all day. I believe this is here for a year. university policy. But if you want a few more, then uh, you know, then you gotta start having a space because for each of these, what my rule of thumb is you need about 200 cubic feet per minute of cooling. And I don't like to use air conditioning because air conditioning is expensive and it costs money um, to run a lot of it, and not to say, I mean, putting in the chillers and all sorts of other things like that. So I do a lot of cooling. And so if I scale up, say I want to run 10 of these. Okay, well, that's 2,000 cubic feet per minute. 100 of them is 20,000 cubic feet per minute. We've got a little over 400 running at our largest facility, and we just bought another 100 of them because miners are cheap these days. And uh, you can go, to, if you wanted to see, to buy them at the source, you can go to shop.bitmain.com and see how inexpensive they are. Uh, so we set this up, and we bring air down the middle, and these miners take a suction on it, and then blow the hot air out, and we blow them out the other side. So there's a lot of different things that you need as a miner, because like I said earlier, once you get it, then you've got to figure out a way at some point to convert it back into dollars to pay for your electric bill. Um, with this setup, my electric bill's about $20,000 a month. So I need to figure out how to get that stuff to an exchange, get the funds from there to convert to dollars and get the dollars back to the bank and then pay from the bank to the, um, to the power company. And uh, banks are happy to allow you to send your money to the exchanges. They're a little suspicious about money coming back from exchanges, I've found. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's just kind of the way it is. Uh, and, and so I kind of classified it into home miners, you know, less than 20, and you can do that as a hobby, a side job, other things like that. In fact, that's the best way to start a company is to do it as a side job. Um, that way you still get health care and a salary. Yeah? Uh, my friends in mine are telling me that the latest, they always want the latest machines. They said there's long lead times on those, but you just said that they're pretty cheap, right? So. Is it long lead time for these machines? Not now. When did you get that information? I don't know. Maybe two months ago? It was long lead times back then. <laughs> <laughs> but Bitcoin has gone down in price significantly, and it's just like the stock market. When the stock market's really high, everybody wants to buy stocks. And when the stock market's low, nobody wants to buy them or invest in businesses. It's the same thing in the crypto market. When the price is really high, people are like, where do you get stuff? You know, I want to start mining, and now the price is really low when you should be investing if you're a true believer in cryptocurrency. Nobody wants to buy miners. Yeah. Me and a couple of partners, we just got together and bought a building. And, you know, we're getting that outfitted. We're going to bring in one megawatt of power and on, on the way to doing two. And we're buying miners left and right, getting ready to go. So, uh, I, I was trying to listen to you carefully, but so just sort of like this rack, these racks you have here, or if I had 20 miners, yeah. Uh, what's sort of the expectation these days on how many Bitcoin you can mine? Sure. And there's so many different things to mine, or but you whatever. end up wanting to convert them back into Bitcoin because the exchanges typically will convert Bitcoin or Litecoin or depending on what exchange you use, like Coinbase or Kraken, back into dollars. Um, this is a graphics card miner. It costs about $3,000 and is mining Ethereum Classic right now. And it's making about... $250 a month gross with about a $50 a month electricity bill. So it should be netting me about $200 a month. Yeah. Uh, so I've been reading that you know, the IRS is starting to crack down on cryptocurrencies, reclassifying them, taxing you when you convert it from one cryptocurrency to another. Is there any taxes that you pay when you mine? Cryptocurrency or anything you have to yes. recognize? So I set this up as a business. Right. Um, and the nice thing about setting up it as a business is all the business expenses um, come <coughs> off the top uh, from the income. The way that I have to report the income um, is the value of the cryptocurrency when it's mined. And I talked with my accountant about this. I can do this daily, weekly. I do it on a monthly basis. So, for example, I'll do an average of mine to my this much Bitcoin at an average price of this per month, that's my income. Then when I sell it, there's a capital gain or loss. So those are both taxable events. Yes, I read that the IRS made a ruling so that when you trade from one cryptocurrency to another, that's a taxable event as well. I think it's a poor choice for bureaucracies to make rules that are not enforceable and are ridiculous. 
Um, <laughs> so we'll have to see how the IRS enforces that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, you can, I, and I have talked to people, they're like, I don't want to get into doing cryptocurrencies or mining because I don't want to have to deal with the tax situation. And I'm like, well, man, you know, you shouldn't let the IRS scare you from not doing business. There's, there's always, there's always ways to calculate taxes. Sometimes you do the best you can, sometimes you approximate it, but absolutely. Um, if, I, if I have one or two of these machines at home, I'm not sure that, I, and I was mining to my own wallet, I'm not sure that I would report that on my taxes. Right? But I, I have a business. I, I have to, you know, I have to have banking relationships. I have to be able to get power. I, I, there's all sorts of things I have to do, so I've got to stay in compliance uh, with the government. Yeah. Uh, this is a relevant question. What business uh, in structure, entity structure do you use? Is it LLC? Or yeah, I set it up as an LLC. Um, you know, with the tax law changes, because with an LLC, uh, all the, the, the profits, they flow to my personal tax return. Um, and so uh, mining income would be treated as ordinary income. What I recommend people do, though, is hold their cryptocurrencies for more than a year so that when they sell them, it turns into a long-term capital gain as opposed to a short-term that has usually better tax consequences. With the tax law changes of uh, C-Corp taxes going from 35% to 21, 25, something like that, sometimes people are saying it might be worth changing to a C-Corp and retain the profits uh, and not distribute them. So, but I'm still set up as an LLC. Do you hedge at all any of the currencies that you provide? So, um, I'll tell you what I do, and you can tell me if it's hedging or not. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'll mine. Yeah. And I'll hold on to the currencies for a while. And there's some currencies that are mineable and some that aren't. And uh, when and I watch them, I'm like, wow, that price is kind of high compared to Bitcoin, so I'll convert some of them into Bitcoin. And then I'll hold on, I'll, I'll wait at least three months. And then I'll hold on to a bunch of Bitcoin, and then when I'm like, wow, that Bitcoin is really high compared to the dollars, I'll sell some of it into dollars. And I like to have ideally six months of expenses in dollars in my bank account, um, and then uh, some cushion on the Bitcoin and some cushion on the, crypto on the other cryptocurrencies, the altcoins. So if that's what you mean by hedging, then yeah. yes, that's yeah, what I did. That totally makes sense. I just know I've read a couple of things about miners have been selling for uh, futures contracts. Okay. Um, like COB, OE, and the CME, basically just to lock in the profits that they have right now and basically say, you know, I'm going to mine like 10 Bitcoin, but basically I'm going to receive that up front. Yeah, and, and that's why so I draw a difference between home miners and uh, uh, small miners, like myself, and then miners that operate as businesses. So the larger facility, me and my business partner, it's just the two of us. We don't have investors, we don't have customers, um, we don't have employees. All right, we get our kids to work sometimes. But, <laughs> um, but in that case, we don't have to provide reports to anybody. We don't have to justify what we do to anybody. Um, we don't have investors that we have to tell what we're doing all the time. I would expect that those miners that uh, sell futures contracts and do other things like that are part of larger firms. You're, in the news, like, Rob, you said that um, you know, mostly it's large Chinese cryptocurrency miners. And, and I think they're a large part of the market, but sometimes those are the only ones that are willing to be interviewed. It's like the business press. You'll hear so much about that they keep their business private, but it might be wildly profitable. profitable. Um, gosh, one of the good books that I read in the last year was uh, about, if you, you go to the airport and you see these um, uh, st the stores that you can buy the stuff and not pay taxes, Duty-free, duty duty free, right? So those duty-free stores were started, I don't know, about 40, 50 years ago, and the people that were running them were just making gobs of money. And they were a private company, and they didn't ever tell anybody. And you know, you go up to Cornell, half of Cornell was paid for by the guy that started the duty-free stores. It's a really good story. Um, and he ended up actually going to a Caribbean island, converting everything into, um, into a, a charity. And it immediately became I think one of the largest uh, charities in the world. So it's, it's a cool story. But yeah, there's there's a ton of private, but you never hear about them because they're private. So um, I guess my point is, one of the reasons that I started my blog and uh, YouTube channel is to teach people that it's possible to run a business as mid-sized miner and to encourage the decentralization of mining all over the place. 
because yes, there are a, a lot of big industrial miners out there, and they, they do subscribe to different mining pools, uh, but you'd be surprised, there's a lot of people, um, and a lot of them reach out to me, that are mid-sized and small miners all over the place. So it's more distributed than you might think. Yeah. Really common sense question. What do you get about security slash insurance? Because like you're setting up these like very expensive race facilities and whatnot, but like not only are they expensive as a cost, but like the um, price or like what they can bring in as like income is very valuable as well. So like how do right. you protect yourself from like getting robbed or something like that? Yeah, so I mean there's there's physical security, right? So I mean we hire a security system. I have a cameras with alarms and people to watch them and if there's a problem and someone comes in they call the police and the police come back. So we're, we're and then um, uh, I get business insurance from the state farm agent so in case there's things. Uh, everything that we built was done to code and we had the fire inspector come in and he's like yeah those fans are cool but hey let's put a smoke detector in the exhaust fans so that if the exhaust fans detect smoke it shuts down all the intake fans. Well, yeah, yeah that makes sense let's do that. And so we had all the, the, the things done to compliance. So I don't know. I tell people I don't I don't tell people in the cryptocurrency mining business. I tell them not. I run a private data center um, that is a high de high density power private data center uh, that is um, cooled by natural air circulation. That's what, that's what most people need to know because it's true. First of all, and a lot of people don't want to know the details. They're just like, what do you do? Oh, okay. <laughs> So people that understand and know about cryptocurrency, they're still a minority in the market. I, I talk with people about this, and they're like, where are we on the hype cycle, on the, on the Gartner life cycle? I mean, how many people do you know that actually own cryptocurrencies? Would you put it in the single digits? I'd put it in the single digits still. And, and that means that you know, we're not at the 30% crossing the chasm point. We're still at the very early stage of the life cycle. How many people in this room own cryptos? I think everyone should Yeah. But y'all have self selected into yeah. a small subset, right? So, um, anyway, so here's some pictures of common mining hardware. And they all use somewhere between about 1,000 to 1,500 watts. They, they're all optimized for different things. So, we talk about the SHA 256 algorithm for Bitcoin. So that's the secure hashing algorithm that's 256 bits. Well, you can use a supercomputer to do it, but it's way better to buy these cards that have small chips that are optimized just to do SHA-256 hashing. And there's cards that are like that for the script algorithm that is used for Litecoin. There's cards like that for the X11, which is actually 11 algorithms in a row, that's used for Dash. Um, there's one that just came out for Crypto Night. There's one that came out for other things. Um, the Swiss Army knives are the GPU miners. So these are used, just like Rob said, for more ASIC resistant. And by that, they're not resistant to ASICs. You can build an ASIC easily to do any of these things. However, they're algorithms that use more memory. So it's like, OK, we'll create a string of whatever that goes into four gigs of memory and then read something back. And then you're like, man, if I'm going to build an ASIC that can do that same thing, I'm going to have to put a ton of memory into the ASIC. And it's actually more expensive to put memory into an ASIC than it is to just buy the memory. So this, so graphics cards have about 2,000 processors, and this, these have about 8 gigs of memory in them. So it's 8 gigs of memory and 2,000 processors. There's a shortage right now of graphic cards from NVIDIA or AMD. The shortage is not in the chips from, the, from NVIDIA or from AMD. It's from the fast memory that they need to buy to go on those cards. So it's actually a memory shortage, uh, not an actual graphic chip shortage. Okay, so I recommend everybody who's looking to do this, buy your own space. Now, I got lucky in the second place that I went. So I found, uh, it's about 10 minutes from my house, which is great, makes it convenient. I did fly up to Montreal to talk to Quebec Power, because there's a little less power up there, but then I have to fly up there once a month. And you know, flying up there once a month is a pain and expensive. Uh, even though I'm paying a little bit more in power here, overall it's less to have it close to my house. So I was able to find this, and you can see over on the left here there's a transformer. That's the transformer just for the part of my building that's over on the side here. And when we first put it in, it was a 500 kVA transformer, which is about 500 kilowatts. And then we turned up enough miners to use 500 kilowatts, and the power company called. They're like, hey, we need to uh, upgrade your transformer. Uh, and I'm like, okay. They're like, yeah, 
we just, uh, it's summer's coming up. They're like, we can schedule it anytime you want. Weekday, weeknight, um, you know, week, uh, at any time. And I'm like, ah, just come do it in the middle of the day. It doesn't matter. So they upgraded us to a 750 kilowatt transformer for no cost. I guess we pay them a monthly bill. But, um, <laughs> but now we're going to add 100 more miners because we got the ability yeah. to do that. So I got a deal with the landlord. I said, hey, I want to put uh, things in the big roll up garage door and then I want to cut four holes in the back and put fans in. And some friends of mine that are looking to do the same thing, they've gone and talked to the potential landlords and they're like, yeah, we don't want you cutting holes in the building. We don't want the noise. We don't want the electrics, all the electric build out. So I got really lucky with this building. Um, and then for the next build out we're doing, me and some partners had to buy another building. Um, Okay, so there's a lot of electricity. Here's my son checking out um, half of our existing electric build out. So this does about 250 kilowatts. Um, so the electricity comes in at 208 volts, three phase, uh, 1200 amps, and it gets split out, and then we uh, pull single 30 amp. So this is, I'm actually a little bit surprised that I didn't trip a breaker on here. Because if I plug the second one of these in, it would trip the breaker. Um, so, there, I mean, these things use a lot of electricity. That's just the way it is. Um, now, how much electricity do all the bank buildings and the people that are in the banks use and all the different stuff? I don't know. I still think banks use more electricity than Bitcoin right now. Um, but uh, they provide a good, important service, at least. Uh, okay. Yeah, go for it. I'm sorry. No, ask as many questions as you want. I got an hour and a half. So your machines, uh, so when you do your, since you're running this business, right, you need to think about cost of your, the cost of your uh, cost of goods. And yeah. So how do you advertise these machines? Because they're pretty specific, right? Yeah, I mean, I treat them as uh, servers, so it's a five-year accelerated depreciation. Uh, but usually I sell them before the five years is up, so I have to do a depreciation recapture when I sell them. So I got some graphics cards that I bought two years ago um, for about uh, $300 each, and I've been selling them uh, a few on eBay every week. I should have sold them a couple months ago, so I've got like $600 per. I'm getting about $350, $400 per. So the depreciation that I did on those graphics cards, I don't know, what's it called when you make a profit after two years? Yeah. Anyway, there's a lot of depreciation to recapture on that. But yeah, that's part of the idea. And, and some of the things like the, the build-out, like the electric build-out, you know, it's about $100,000 or whatever. So those go, those go against the profits that are made. So if you do a build-out like this the first year, you should at least have no profits, at least. The numbers you get for $3,000 and then $200 a month, that the electricity, so that's like 15 months. Yeah, but there was four hundred dollars a month back in December. So average, it's going to be usually whatever you buy, it ends up being about ten to twelve months payback. There's externalities, but and there's a, there's a lot of variability, and it's really hard to model how fast other people are adding things and what's going on with the price. So what I do is try to buy my stuff as cheap as possible and keep my costs as low as possible. Because if I hired an employee and, and paid that employee $3,000 a month, I mean, boom, that's, that's a cost. Whether I pay electricity or employees or whatever, I gotta keep the amount of money flowing out as low as possible. Yeah? How much would it cost to like, switch to like water or to like cool? To cool it with water? Yeah. Liquid cooling? Yeah. I'd have to buy all the liquid cooling stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then I have to figure out how to change all the um, uh, BIOS, the uh, things for this to run without the fan running. And then anytime there was a problem and I needed to fix it, I'd have to fish them all out of the liquid cooling. And I could probably gain about 20% efficiency on cooling. Of course, the liquid cooling just transfers the heat to the liquid and then you have to pump the liquid outside to a cooling tower and, and cool it there. So I don't like adding complexity if I don't have to. So for me, it's no, there's no reason at all to do liquid cooling because I have air that's cool enough, even 95 degree air that comes in. Um, as long as I move the air through quickly enough, uh, it doesn't recirculate around and recirculate hot air into it. That's the part you gotta 
got to be worried about. If I bring in 95 degree air and it keeps it cool, that's fine. If I don't bring enough airflow in, if I do only 100 cubic feet per minute instead of 200, then the hot air kind of builds up and it turns into 120, 130, 140 degree air, and then it shuts down from overheat. So I'm, I'm sure liquid cooling works for some people. I just don't see a reason to do it. Um, oh, I had a piece of the, uh, these are really thick copper cables. And so just like when I first got into IT and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to put Wi-Fi and phone systems in place and things like that. That'll be really cool. And then I'll type up all the commands and stuff like that. What I learned was that there's a lot of carrying around of big heavy boxes in nasty little phone closets. Um, and there's a lot of physical labor involved in, in IT. I mean, if you're just a software developer, I guess there isn't, but there's an interface to the real world that has to happen. Um, and, you know, so yeah, I got electric guys that are putting in conduit there, there's heavy piping there, there's, that, here me and some friends and my son went and visited a hydropower plant at uh, Tallulah Gorge uh, hydropower plant so we can see where it's really done. And after I sold my business, in addition to uh, cryptocurrency mining, I got my commercial drone license and started flying drones to see if I could make money doing that. I did 3D printing to see if I could make money doing 3D printing. Then I set up uh, solar powered Wi-Fi mesh networks to see if I could make money doing that. And they're all, you can make money with all those things, but this is, this is easier uh, and more profitable. But like this solar panel is 100 watts. So in addition to liquid cooling, people say, hey, can you do solar power? And absolutely I can do solar power. So let's run the numbers on that. This uses about 1,000 watts, right? Okay, so if I had a 100 watt solar panel, I'd need 10 of those for one machine during the day. But then I need to actually have enough power to last 24 hours a day, you know, at night, or I could just, I guess, use them during the day. Um, but I, I get deep cycle batteries, and then instead of 10 panels, I could do 30 panels. So 30 panels and deep cycle batteries for one machine. And if for 10 machines, I guess I'd need 300 panels. For 100 machine, I'd need 3,000 panels. And for 400 machines, I'd need 12,000 solar panels like this. I prefer not to be a solar panel farmer, so solar power is out for me. But having said that, um, I was uh, down in Guatemala visiting some folks that see my blog and videos, and they, I was just happened to go through there, so I stopped in and talked to them. And they have rainy season there. And they're between the Pacific and the Atlantic, and they got mountains and they got wind. So um, they, they're like, yeah, at one of our farms, we have a 100 kilowatt power plant, uh, hydropower plant, for six months of the year. We could probably power you know, a bunch of miners off that. And then the government had incentives to put in private uh, hydropower. So they also own a three megawatt power plant. They know someone that owns a 100 megawatt power plant. You'd be surprised how many different places in the world you can buy electricity for four cents a kilowatt hour. I pay about six or seven cents a kilowatt hour, which is a decent price, but there's places all over the world. There's, there's power plants that have extra power that they, they can't do anything with, and they can sell it to you for two or three or four cents a minute. You just gotta get your miners there. So another thing that you can think about doing is buying a piece of land and, and then building your own micro hydropower plant. So micro hydropower plants are 500 kilowatts or less. And those are every bit as efficient as the large power plants um, that people run. Oh, and then these are like 30 amp connectors. So I just use common components. And people give me a hard time about my wiring and stuff like that. But when I have my two hour, <laughs> one or two hours per day to go to my facility to work on stuff, there's always some things that need to be tweaked or fixed or stuff like that. So most of it is a hands-off business unless there's like we need to clean the filters on the fans or uh, put in a bunch of new miners. My first place, I didn't have filters on these fans. And so you don't have the pollen season here with the <laughs> yellow <laughs> pollen. Yeah. Um, so these uh, heat uh, exchangers here, these uh, they would fill up with pollen. So I'd have to get an air compressor and, and blow them out. These are pretty easy. Uh, but the ones that have the fans on the front and the back, um, you have to open those up and blow them out and take the cards out. It's a real work intensive process. Uh, so there's a lot of little things to, to learn over time. Um, yeah, and then uh, you can suffer, supplement it with evaporative cooling. So put some water in the filters or air and that cools it down a little bit. 
Uh, winter actually have to turn down the, the fans uh, a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a lot of air. So, oh, these fans are each 20,000 cubic feet per minute. So this is about 80,000 cubic feet per minute of airflow um, that we do. 80,000 in, 80,000 out. And here's just a, a few more pictures. And I, I don't want to get into too many details, but there are a lot of things that you learn over time. I've been doing this for a few years now. Um, and our first design is, yeah, we bring air into the middle because we found a place where we could use the roll-up garage door. At our next place, we're going to bring in air in one side of the building and then send air out the other side and actually make a bigger box. So um, some of these things, we'll do the preliminary design, but then we'll actually get the professionals in there. We'll get electricians in to do the electricity, get the HVAC guys to do the, you know, the, the fans. We actually have a cooling engineer that uh, looks at the things. We have architects do the architectural drawings. Um, that's me standing against the fans outside. You can see in there they're filtered. Uh, and there's little things that you learn. These are the fan controllers. You think fan controllers are, are important? You just, I need a fan controller. Right? Well, some of them are variable speed fan controllers. So you can turn the speed up and down. I figured out I didn't need those. Some of them are electronic fan controllers, which are great. And when building power goes down, and then building power comes back up, all the miners come on. But electronic fan controllers, they release internally, so those fans don't come back on. We learned that the hard way. So the next <laughs> set of fans we did, we got mechanical fan controllers. And I mean, it's just little things that you learn that you, nobody's going to write these in a book. But, but, and that's why I tell everybody, okay, if you're going to do, if you're going to do cryptocurrency mining, start small and learn a lot of the basics when you're small so you can make the mistakes. And this applies to a lot of different businesses as well. Start small and bootstrap your way up. By the time that you get big, you've learned a lot of different lessons. I was talking to a friend of mine who owns a really large CrossFit gym. And he's been in business to, since 2009. He's, he's seen a lot, and he started really, really small, learned to keep his costs low. And it's very easy for someone to walk into his big CrossFit gym and say, I can do this. And somebody can. They can put a lot of money into it. And people say, yeah, I can build a thousand mining facility. I can find the money. But you're going to make so many mistakes and waste so much money and possibly not even be profitable. There's something to be said for uh, learning and growing a business along the way. That's why franchises are so successful. There's a, they're a full up business model of the cryptocurrency over time. So if you can buy now by mining and then hold on to it and see it go up in price, as the, the cryptocurrency goes up in value, like I, I mined Zen for a long time. Um, need to have, a, from a business standpoint, lots of different cryptocurrencies that we mine. Um, I know you think we just mine. Hey, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I know the team's pretty good. They're going to be around for a while. <laughs> but it's the same thing. I, I can mine Ethereum or Ethereum Classic. I'm not really sure what's going on with Ethereum right now, but I know the Ethereum Classic people have a plan. And so I mine Ethereum Classic, uh, I mine Zcash, I mine the things that are going to be around for a while and I hold on to it because on the look back, okay, so I said this is mining maybe $8 a day right now of Ethereum Classic. I'm going to hold on to that. A year from now, Ethereum Classic might have gone up two or three times in value. So on the look back, I've been mining $24 to $30 per day if I've held on to it because of the rising cryptocurrency prices. So that takes my profitability from about $200 to $250 per month on this machine to, I don't know, $800 per month? And that's kind of where you get the 10 month, because if I just look at how much I'm making right now on a daily basis, it's a 12 to 15 month payoff, but if you go on the historical price rise over time, it comes down to a 10 to 12 month payoff. Um, anyway, so you can research the different cryptocurrencies on coinmarketcap.com. Um, try to hold on as much. Right now, from the way cryptocurrency has been set up, I don't know if Robson talked about this, but we're in, it's, it's, it's an asset that's turning into a currency. And if you read some of the papers on assets that are turning into currencies, people are accumulating and they go up in price. Once they turn into actual currencies, then they'll be a little bit more price stable. So you have to recognize what phase of the market you're in as well. Um, okay, yeah. Hey Rob, what about on the downside? So I can just bear market. Yeah. Like, how's the street mean? So that's where sometimes, oh, well, I keep costs really low. Uh, and so uh, I've actually talked, some people have reached out and we said, 
hey, I've, I've turned off my miners. And, and I'm like, why would you turn off their miner, your miners? And they're like, well, uh, I'm mining, and it's costing me um, you know, about the same as I'm getting in profits. And I'm like, well, are you selling? They're like, no. I'm like, well, then you keep mining, because it's going to go up in price. Um, so there are some people, but some folks don't maintain a reserve, they don't maintain a hedge, and since the largest cost is electricity, if, if you're in a position where you don't have the financial means, or, or you're a really large uh, organization, or you have uh, built your business on debt, then you might have to actually shut it down and, and cut your costs. So for me, I keep my costs really low, and I'm very conservative. I learned this in the IT business uh, that, I, that I had. Uh, we had about 60 employees when we sold it, and we would uh, be profitable and build up a bunch of, of cash, and then we'd spend that hiring people and doing improvements. So we'd keep getting bigger and bigger, but we'd never have like a lot of cash on hand. And so for this business, I'm like, we're not going to expand. We're going to maintain a larger amount of cash so we can handle the ups and downs of the market uh, and see like. Like the prices are really low on miners right now. I didn't buy them two months ago when the price was really high. I had the ability to wait and buy miners when they're cheap because I'm maintaining a cash cushion. So we're doing great. In fact, uh, we'd still be profitable at a Bitcoin price of four thousand dollars. Yep. Um, and I read in an article the other day that the most uh, commercial miners uh, they need Bitcoin price to be of eight thousand to be profitable. However, they take on debt, they have debt service, they have investors that have expectations of repayment. Uh, me and my business partner, we can run this business however we want. And we talk about this periodically, we're in it for the long term. And we also model it out so that if we, you know, at the end of every year, if we've made all our money back, worst case, we can just shut the business down, sell everything off, and then go do something else. I mean, businesses have a start. Is the, the price and volume of a cryptocurrency graph will often indicate that something's happening with a cryptocurrency before first, they'll start buying or selling. So some people trade only on technical price signals and they make a lot of money doing that. I'm not very good at that, so I stay away from it. I learned early on when I was doing small amounts of stock market trading that I was, that I was bad at it. So I do this. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. And so, like, when I uh, paid uh, someone in Bitcoin the other day, I used my hardware wallet and I sent them, I think, about 0.4 Bitcoins. Um, and I looked at the transaction on the Block Explorer and it said that it had sent 10 point something out and I had received 10 point whatever back. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's change that has to be returned. Now, when, you, when I talk about trading, uh, basically, it's like if you're using Charles Schwab or Fidelity or some kind where you deposit a bunch of money and they hold it and you don't actually have that money. It's the same thing with cryptocurrency trading. You deposit your Bitcoins or whatever um, at something like Bitrex or Coinbase and it's theirs. They own it. You don't own it at that point. They have the private keys to the cryptocurrency. They owe you cryptocurrency. If they go out of business, then you can do your best to try to collect it back. But once it's within their system and their proprietary database, everything happens really fast. So you can trade small amounts of Bitcoin for uh, Zencash or whatever else that you want. And then when you want to withdraw it, then you give them uh, your, your wallet address and you can withdraw however much you want to withdraw. So but that's really when it's sitting in that pool, it's almost like it's in dollars. Because like when you look at like a bit wallet or something, it's, it's kind of just like it's in dollars. You can look at it as in dollars. They'll give you equivalent amount for what you have in your online wallet. But then that, that's what that's what you're asking is the exact reason why I tell people start somehow. So if you if y'all are going to start on bit shares, you know that that works great because you'll you'll go through the same exact experience there where you'll um, it, it usually there it's like foreign exchange trading where you're trading in different monetary pairs. 
so say you wanted to go to Canada, right? You can't spend U.S. dollars there. You need Canadian dollars. Now, the, the price of Canadian dollars to U.S. dollars changes every day. And so whatever the exchange rate is, you, you get it there. Uh, it's the same thing with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency trading. They're done in trading pairs. And most, the most common trading pair is, a, is some kind of cryptocurrency to Bitcoin, or in some cases to Ethereum. Bitcoin can be usually traded directly for dollars or uh, euros or things like that. So most of the denominations of cryptocurrencies that you see on an exchange are actually in relation to Bitcoin. You can do a double conversion over to US dollars, but that starts to um, have issues where if the price of Bitcoin goes down, then every single cryptocurrency goes down in price also because they're all related to Bitcoin, which is then related to dollars when they actually might be going up compared to their trading pair of Bitcoin, just not going up as much. So if you go, for example, go to Bitrex.com or Polonix.com and look at the different trading pairs and look at the graphs, you'll see an indicator of that. Yeah. So you're very steeped in, in understanding, like going back to your fundamental analysis that comes with like the trading and how you figure out what to mine. I mean, you're profiting though on, like, like obviously like when, when currencies go up. So. How, that's how do you separate maybe like what you see is valuable, but then also trying to find the hype that's going to boost the price up. For, because maybe you know things are overhyped, but you still can gain on that. Um, is there like a happy medium? Yeah. So you could join Telegram groups that say we're going to accumulate this cryptocurrency, and then we're going to tell people a bunch of fake news about it and get people to buy into it and get the price to go up, and then we'll start to sell. And I've talked and read articles about it. I haven't participated in that myself, except inadvertently. Um, and a lot of times, the people that are running those things are the only ones that make the money. Uh, so, uh, and if you're gonna try getting into, this is a fairly unregulated market, so there are pump and dump schemes, there's hype, there's all sorts of different things like that. But pretty much the only thing that I would do is if I own a cryptocurrency and they go through a hype cycle where they go up in price, I'll be like, whew, that's overvalued. And I'll sell my stuff. Because um, you've got to take advantage of situations like that. Um, I mean, would, would you say it makes a lot of the inherent sense to risk putting it in these kind of like people that are doing something that, that you introduce a lot of risk? Like we talked earlier about like people being able to hack with a website like to be a Like mm -hmm. that Well, why doesn't everybody in the world use English? But the point of English isn't like security and privacy and all those things. Like you have this software, this kind of peer-to-peer -peer network, and then when you move into something else, like you almost lose everything that you did this whole verification process for. So mm -hmm. I wonder, like, what's kind of the what's the catch there that people are so attracted to? Well, like William Gibson says, system. the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Um, just because something is possible doesn't mean it's going to actually happen. And so if you look at this typical Bitcoin meme up here, uh, yeah. saying, you know, Bitcoin's gonna be worth millions of dollars, actually the reality and what a lot of people that are into cryptocurrencies think is that cryptocurrencies will entirely replace the entire banking and government system. And so, uh, now, will it be Bitcoin? I mean, Bitcoin is designed to be inefficient, just like the QWERTY keyboard on typewriter is designed to be inefficient, and the Dvorak keyboard is much more efficient. But uh, so are there better cryptocurrency systems out there? Yeah, there's people that think that BitShares is better, or EOS, or Cardano. There's people, and cryptocurrencies are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, I happen to think that privacy is going to be really important, and I think Zcash has created a wonderful thing, and I think what we did with Zencash is make it a lot more usable for people, and a lot more sustainable. There's different ideas of what's going to be successful, and you cannot academically just study those ideas and come out with the right answer. You have to take your ideas and crash them into reality and see what comes out of it. And then what comes out of it, what people really ex accept, can be a completely different surprise. Um, like we, we, Zcash, we experimented with secure notes. We had no idea what the uptake would be or if people would do it, and we were overwhelmed by the success of, of that. And, and sometimes what you think, that's why a lot of startups will do a pivot. They'll create some 
idea, they'll create a minimal, minimal viable product, they'll get it out to the market, and then they'll realize of the 10 different things, you know, throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks, they'll have the market say, this one thing is really valuable, and they'll say, okay, well, this one thing is what we're, we're going to focus on. And they could have studied it for years, but until they actually got it out amongst customers, they would have had no idea at all. So it could seem that Bitcoin is the be-all and end-all, and they have the best developers, and they're going to continue to stay ahead of everybody. It's a wide open market. You don't know what's going to happen. It's like, it's like networking. Everybody uses Ethernet now. Ethernet wasn't the most popular networking protocol. Token Ring was, because it was invented by IBM. IBM was the big computer company, and everybody had said Token Ring was going to crush everything. Nope, no Token Ring anymore. You don't set that up in your house. So, Can I say something? Yeah. Okay, um, and one more thing to answer the question is, a lot of the token, um, a lot of the reasons people would want to buy another token or another coin is because it might serve a purpose on a different platform, like how it's a service provider, like a distributed version of Dropbox, which is more file coin. Um, and so right now, the only way to trade between cryptocurrencies is to go through some of the centralized party, centralized exchange, that essentially holds your crypto and makes a transaction for you. Um, and Rob can probably talk more about this in later classes, but the next, like, uh, the next wave is going to be centralized exchanges and these things from public swaps that allow you to trade on-chain or on side chains um, between those directly instead of having to go to fiat or always having to do it. So it's mostly that people want other coins because they have other uses or like present, for example, um, we get people with different rights um, over their own data um, and also totally the transaction kind of services. Yeah, and that's, that's only on the currency side. Yeah. I mean, Ethereum's so popular because it can do smart contracts and generate tokens, like you said. And a lot of the, um, if you look into, uh, let's see, Hernando de Soto's got a book called The Mystery of Capital, and he's really one of the top 10 economists around, and he goes through and identifies why so many different countries are poor and why some countries have a lot of wealth. And, and actually, the poor countries have people that are just as smart, just as hardworking, but they're set up in a system that doesn't have the ability to recognize the capital that they have and trade it amongst people. So if we can have a more efficient system um, that does smart contracts or recognizes capital or things like that, then um, it's entirely possible without a corrupt government in the way, uh, like a lot of these countries have, that people can become a lot more profitable and, and wealthy and expand the pie overall. Okay, so did I spell hold wrong here? No, it's a Bitcoin meme. It took me a while to figure this out. Here's a Bitcoin talk post. Yeah, this is an important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can probably dig this up, but um, you know, if you're a hodler, this comes from this guy's drunken Bitcoin post where he complains about not being effective at trading, and he's just going to hold on to his Bitcoin and see. To heck with all y'all. And what year was this? 13? It was a while ago, yeah. But I mean, I, I'd been in cryptocurrencies for, you know, a year, and I'm like, why are these guys saying hot? So I looked it up. He was great about that. So anyway. <laughs> um, like how he said, he's had some whiskey right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I try to do uh, videos on that are aimed for people that want to go from small hometown mining, or home mining to mid-sized mining to treat it as uh, as their full-time job. So my, my idea is you can start doing this as a part-time job and then over time accumulate capital and do this as your as your full-time job. I, I really have people from all over the world that watch these videos and comment on them. Um, and then I have a website that's uh, similar. Some people prefer videos, some people prefer words. I haven't monetized them yet. I'm thinking about doing that. Um, and uh, so check that out if you're interested in mining. But you don't need to be a software developer, you don't need to be a trader, and you don't need to be a miner to succeed in the cryptocurrency world. This is a brand new industry. This is an exponential growth curve industry. This is a graph of different industries and their growth curves over time. Imagine if you were one of the people involved in rolling out electricity to houses for the very first time, or phones, or in the early automobiles. Imagine when they were rolling out radio or telegraph or, I don't know, plumbing. You know, there's a lot of different industries that have gone through exponential growth curves over time, and they're accelerating. And each of these industries needs to have all sorts of different skill sets. The small businesses um, that, are, are, that really are the backbone of the economy need to have lots of different skills. I say for if you're going to start a business, you at least need to have the three basics. 
of a technical person um, and a salesperson and an accounting person. So you can go out and sell your product so someone can install it and someone can do the numbers and bill them and, and things like that. As you expand your business, you need to do more and more. Um, like with Zencash, we have in-house legal counsel, we have an accountant, we have business development or salespeople uh, that are out and spreading the word. We have technical folks, we have support people. Every one of these cryptocurrency projects to be successful, like you said earlier, it needs to be a full stack business. Um, so if you are interested in this, great, go find a project and it uses the open source ethos, so go figure it out and learn about it and start contributing. And once you start contributing and in, in a positive way and people see that you're contributing, they'll be like, hey, we need to keep that person around and do more stuff. Um, and there's other rapidly growing uh, industries uh, right now uh, that you, you could do uh, also. But this one just, I mean, to me, this is one that's most exciting. So, um, yeah. And then, if you do get some cryptocurrencies, figure out how to not lose them. <laughs> That's why it's good to start small. You know, have a wallet on your, on, on your computer. Uh, learn how to send funds to and from an exchange. Uh, I'll buy 50 miners at a time from China, and I'll send them, where did I send them last time? They're about, right now they're about they're on sale, they're about $1,000 each. So I sent about 50000 in a Bitcoin transaction. Um, you know, first time you do that, you're like, I'm just pushing this button, and 50,000 is going, and yep, it's gone. They got it, so okay, great. <laughs> but then you get used to doing it, and you're just winging large amounts of cryptocurrency around because you've learned on small ones, and they've grown to big ones. And then you need to figure out, um, okay, how do I, what do I do with my hardware wallets? And what are the different possible ways that I might lose the information on my hardware wallet? So there's a 24-word key, and I'm like, well, I'm... I need to write that down, then I need to put it in that safe, but what if that safe gets stolen or on fire, then I need to put it in this safe. And then I've got all these new cryptocurrencies that aren't on hardware wallets yet, so I've got it running on a computer and I've switched over to using just Linux, and everything's encrypted on it, and then I back it up to like different hard drives, and then I put those hard drives in different safes and different buildings. I mean, it, 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 can, it can build on itself, but if you're going to go to all this work to get all these cryptocurrencies that you think are going to take over the world and be excessively valuable someday, then you may as well spend a little bit of time and effort learning how to hold on to them. And I was reading a, a, a funny article the other day. It's like, hey, even with Bitcoin price really low, think of the true wealth that you've gained. Because the true wealth isn't in currencies. You can have a bunch of dollars, and that's not actual wealth. Wealth is things that you've learned. It's the relationships that you have. It's the track record of success that you have, that you have in business. Um, it's investing in your kids. It's all sorts of different things. And you know, figuring out how to um, to gain wealth and with with this cryptocurrency stuff. I've learned so many different things and met so many different people and had so many great experiences. I mean, that to me, that's more of a measure of the wealth. Yeah. So, you know, as, um, speaking of relationships, like in, from your perspective of your business, like what are the pros and cons of joining a minor pool? Um, and like, are you that part of a pool? And that Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah, so with Bitcoin, you have to mine as part of a pool, and because um, based upon the chances, if I was running one machine. You would find a block every 600 years or so. Okay. So, so I'm not going to take that chance. Multiple machines, but then, like, how have you decided to pool, I guess, is the better question. Uh, I find some of the pools that have usually more than about 5% of the overall hash rate and join one of them. Uh, they all have a fee somewhere between, I don't know, 0 and 2%. Uh, I like the ones that pay out once a day, that have nice little status reports and things like that. So. Again, it's, if you start with one miner and you figure out how to join a pool, everything starts to just become clear. You can start, and you don't need even six graphics cards. If, you, if you're a gamer and you have a single graphics card in your gaming machine, when you're not gaming, you can mine. Yes? Can you, so say that if you were to buy Bitcoin in a certain currency, can you, can you get it back in a different currency? Sure. And then... So is it like a common practice for people to buy Bitcoin and then then get it back for a currency that's undervalued in relation to the dollar and then transfer that back into U.S. dollars to make uh, profit? Yeah. Yeah, doing, yeah. Well, the thing is Bitcoin's so volatile. Yeah, doing Forex arbitrage trading, basically, Yeah. and make money that way. There's too much friction on it. 
uh, there's too much exchange fees, there's mm -hmm. too much taxes, and there's a lot of really smart people that have big automated systems that will usually do arbitrage. So it's, it's usually better to find some minor traded cryptocurrency uh, on multiple exchanges and send that back and forth and do arbitrage that way. But to me, arbitrage and trading, they're a numbers game and they're difficult. Mm -hmm. If we want, we can have an arbitrator at the C2 class. It might really be fun to so like, I think, $80 million fund in Australia. And they do that across like Korea and US and China. Yeah, and just like everything else, it kind of seems simple from the outside, it's and then you, it is not simple at all. And it takes like decades to yeah. learn to be good at it, and then it takes even longer to learn how to be good and then not lose all your money. Because it's like Las Vegas, the house always has more than you do. All right, so I'm going to go over some frequently asked questions. Y'all can ask me more questions if you want. Um, bring gifts to the bankers, and you have to like, I mean, setting up bank accounts in other countries, there's huge unbanked populations out there, and it's like night and day. With here, yeah, get a wallet on your mobile phone, and bam, you're banked. You know, with cryptocurrencies, with you know, banks that use dollars, it, it's not that way. Yeah. You buy miner, you buy miners with crypto, with cryptocurrencies. That's exactly, gone. yeah. So you don't worry about all that. So I stick the, yeah. So like, because um, then you avoid the, then you avoid the capital gains tax too. Do you? No, not according <laughs> my account. I, it, when when I. <laughs> When I buy cryptocurrency, when I use cryptocurrency to buy miners from China, I get the invoice and I get the conversion rate of dollars to cryptocurrency, and then uh, that's a taxable event. That's ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, the most ridiculous part is if you put that ten thousand dollars into Bitcoin, and then you want to trade um, from Bitcoin to another currency, you have to tr you have to pay taxes on that first trade. Uh, from Bitcoin to the other currency, and then in order to actually pay the taxes, just say you have no fiat and all of your money is in crypto, hypothetically, um, you have to actually trade out of that other currency and pay capital gains taxes on the trade that you made in order to pay the first tax. Yeah. Crazy. And the price might have gone up or down since then. It's just, it's ridiculous. So, I don't know. Um, you know we have the government that makes all these legislative rules that we have to follow because. If not, we don't get the benefits of a free society. You know, the U.S. is the only country I know that, that taxes its citizens when they're not in the U.S. I think Colombia does that now, too. And I, I think there's a couple other, but yeah, there's, there's. I mean, we can talk for days about this type of stuff. Um, okay, so how do you work with banks? I used to work with banks really well. Uh, why don't you sell power? Will I make money? I don't know. I don't know if you make money if you start mining. Um, I'd say try it. Uh, oh, how long is mining good for? I don't know how long mining is going to be good for. Uh, that's why I try to set it up so, I mean, because Bitcoin is relatively inefficient in its use of power, and there might be something better that comes along. I think we're going to get, so my, my numbers are usually off. I think mining is going to be good and profitable for like three to four more years, but things take a while to change, so it'll probably be like eight to ten years, um, and then we'll move on to something else. So. And I could be completely wrong, it could be good for 30, 40 years. But I'm setting things up so that um, you know, I'm not getting overextended. I see people in the news doing these like $100 million Bitcoin mining investments. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. That's a lot of money to put at risk. There's so many things that could change. So I've already gotten all my initial investment back, and I'm just using um, some profits to do expansion above and beyond that. Uh, and so if I had to shut everything down now, I, I, I'd still be okay. That's where you want to be in the business. Um, why not use air conditioning or immersive cooling? You got that. Air conditioning, you don't need it. Uh, do I do consulting or take investments? <laughs> I got friends that are like, hey, can I just uh, give you some money and you can uh, you know, do more mining? I'm like, no. <laughs> and then I have people like, hey, can you come uh, you know, do investing? And I'm like, and I think about it, and I'm like, the best use of my time is to make sure all my equipment's up and running. And every once in a while I'll go do a talk like this, just because it's fun. Um, but yeah, if, if, I, if I started charging what my per hour was worth, um, based on taking away time from mining, people wouldn't want to pay it. Data network and security, we don't need to talk about that. Mining software, monitoring and management. And 
This is a good one though. How long is it probably good for? Yeah, what's up? I guess the cool thing would be for us, I don't know if you can show us this, like what your view into like your operations would be. That's what interests me, like what it looks like. Yeah, so uh, I kind of skipped over that, but uh, I use a monitoring system called Awesome Miner. The guy who wrote it, named it, I don't care. It costs me about $5 per miner. And it, it, it pulls statistics from every miner that I have. Um, and I can tell it what pool to mine from. And like these, you probably can't see it, but these are D3s that are currently mining, at that time they were mining something called Monetary Unit, U, which is a clone of Dash. Uh, and they were making $9 per day each. Um, and so, and, and, and it's great because if, there, if the equipment has a problem and gets stuck, it'll reboot it. Uh, I can go to a dashboard that tells me how much I'm making on a daily and a monthly basis. Um, a lot of stuff ends up being oh, um, command line type stuff or other things like that, but these are typical minor interfaces. So I'll log into a Bitmain AMP miner and uh, set configuration settings there. Um, this is what the panel up top would be. It has a summary of a bunch of graphic miners and things like that. So just like any other, you walk into a fully formed business and you're like, wow, how did they ever get to this level of complexity? It's just one step at a time. And it's learning a little bit every day and then thinking about something and like, hmm, I could do it better if I tried this other way. And then sometimes you try it and it's better. And then sometimes it's not better. Um, so, uh, I don't know. And then, oh, but equipment. People say, well, how, how often do you upgrade equipment? And, and they're used to the computer industry, which Intel, drives the computer industry, which is all driven by semiconductors. So the, um, the reason that your phone is more powerful than a supercomputer is because Intel and other semiconductor companies have been making more and more processors onto the same area. You might have heard of Moore's Law. So Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, said about every 18 months, the amount of processing power that you can get with the same amount of money doubles. And that's been on that growth curve since the 60s. Um, and so at this point, we talk about semiconductor lithography, and the upshot of it is as the feature size on the chips goes down, the power they use is less, and it's by the square of the area. So for example, to bring this into a daily terms, uh, I have a, a very common mining box is called, uh, that mines Bitcoin, is called an Miner S9 these days. It mines about 13.5 terahash per second. So it's at 13 and a half trillion SHA-256 per second. It uses about 1,500 watts. Um, it's using the 16 nanometer lithography, which is about 14. The picture that I had at the very beginning of the pre presentation was an amp miner S7. It used about 1,500 watts. It was on the 28 nanometer lithography, but it only did about 3.5. Terahash. So when the new equipment came out from Bitmain, they went from the same amount of power, 3.5 terahash, to 13.5 terahash, the same amount of power. So three and a half times as efficient because they went to a new semiconductor. So now, state of the art is 14 or 16 nanometer, and everybody's like, okay, when's mining equipment coming out on 10 nanometer process, which is going to be two and a half times as efficient? When's it coming out on 7 nanometer, which is going to be four times as efficient? And everybody's wondering and figuring out, okay, has somebody already started this kind of stuff? Are there people out there that are running equipment that's four times as efficient as ours from a power standpoint? And that's going to drive the hash rate through the roof. And when that equipment becomes commonly available, I need to start selling my existing equipment and buying the new equipment. So I need to maintain a big chunk of funds for that changeover. So I'll get equipment whenever I can and run the heck out of it until it becomes unprofitable and then I'll sell it because there's still people that will buy it. Because there's countries and places in the world and in individual specific situations where their cost of electricity is much lower than mine and they'll buy it. In fact, I learned this when I was selling my Antminer S7s and selling some new ones. Um, I kept selling them to people in Miami. And then one guy, he's like, hey, one, one of the amp miners is, is bad. I used to sell new ones on Amazon, but there's just too much scanning, so I stopped doing that. Um, he's like, one of them's bad, i got to return it. So I'm like, okay, well, go ahead and send it back. He's like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get it when I come back from Venezuela. And so he had bought four, and he could only fit three of them in his luggage, 
So he said one of them was bad and he shipped them back to me. So this is when I learned that I was selling a lot of them to Miami because they'd throw them in their luggage and go down to Venezuela and sell them to people there because that was the only way for them to get hard currency. And this was way back before all the articles about mining in Venezuela and stuff like that. But yeah, there's always places in the world where if you run up, and, and people there, would, they'd be able to make $200 a month in Bitcoin and feed their family. So that was cool. All right, that's all I got in case y'all had more questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, so for something like that, how, are, <laughs> how important are the non-GPU components? Like, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you need some like, sort of specialized motherboard to run. Yeah, so I use a motherboard that has six PCIe slots. Mm -hmm. Costs about 100 bucks. Cheapest sell around processor around 50 bucks. Uh, memory, maybe 30 bucks. And an SSD uh, with pre-installed mining operating system on it for about 30 bucks. And then the case is about 200 bucks. The power supply is about 200 bucks. And these special PCIe risers are about $10 each. So the case itself is about $700. And when I upgrade the GPUs, I only need to upgrade the GPUs. I only need to upgrade all everything else. And that's why um, having a mining facility where I've already got all the power installed and I already have the GPU components, so once I'm up and running, I can maintain running without having to do as many new investments. So that helps too. But yeah, if you're at all interested, start with a single GPU and start mining. What's the best hardware set to mine Zencast? Uh, it's with NVIDIA graphics cards. So um, you start with one, like an NVIDIA 1070 graphics card. You can probably pick one up for five or $600. Stick it in an old computer um, and start mining. Uh, if you want to just get into it, there's NVIDIA 1050s or 1030s. Those are probably around $100 each. Um, and you can start mining with those. And then there's probably three or four different applications that mine Zencash. You look for Zcash miners, because Zencash is a clone of uh, is a fork of Zcash. And you turn it on and start mining. I use a pre um, a pre-made mining operating system, which is a special build of Linux with all the mining applications preloaded on it, called Ethos Distro. There's another one called Simple Mining. Um, yeah. You said a couple times some certain like cryptocurrencies are clones of others. What is that? <coughs> yeah. So these are open source. Uh, so that means you can go to GitHub.com and see the entire uh, all the software. They make it public, so Bitcoin is public. You go to uh, GitHub and look up the Bitcoin repo, and you can see all the Bitcoin right there. And then you could, and I did this the other day. Uh, I had um, I have an old server, and I ran a virtual machine on it, and I went to the GitHub, and I cloned a copy of the Bitcoin, I, I compiled it, and then I started running Bitcoin right there on that machine. Uh, so I was running a full, full Bitcoin node. Um, and a lot of the cryptocurrencies are fully open source. So what some people want to do to launch a new cryptocurrency is they'll create, and you can do this within GitHub, you can create an exact copy of that entire repository, change a couple small things, and you get your new cryptocurrency. Easy to do. Until you try to get people who want to mine it and buy it and use it. That's the hard part. So Zencash pulls in some stuff from Bitcoin, some from some stuff from Zcash, and then we also created some of our own improvements to, to improve security and reliability. Uh, so it's a little harder to just copy Zcash and use Zencash. We've kind of gone beyond that. Right, okay. So it's just like what other currency is based off of, essentially. Yeah, but we can still go back and pull improvements from Zcash into Zencash. So we have a whole staff of researchers that help us out. Yeah. Doesn't that just create like a snowball effect between the correlations between all the new yeah, so for example, if Bitcoin decided that, if the, the core developers of Bitcoin decided that having the features of privacy were really important because, I don't know, uh, regulators were throwing people in jail after discovering their transactions on the blockchain and correlating it, uh, and the people that have a lot of Bitcoin were sick of that, they could take those improvements that Zcash made and put them right into Bitcoin and give Zcash uh, capabilities into Bitcoin. Of course, then people have to write wallets to take advantage of that, and it would yeah, take yeah. a little while. But, but yeah, you could, you could, if they're similar, you can bring other improvements. In fact, Ethereum, uh, I think they did this. They took the zero knowledge proofs, the zk snarks that the Zenca that the Zcash people did, and pulled those into Ethereum. So there's just total cross pollination. And when you have that in a to in a completely unregulated environment, 
And hyper-connected like that, you get rapid iteration and improvement, uh, and then the market figures out what's best. Um, and, and that's why it's exploded. So like coming from like an economic standpoint, then you have like no competitive advantage, or little to no competitive advantage between, comp uh, between cryptocurrencies, because like each one can just reiterate what another one did, but then... Maybe it, your economic model is too simple, because that's not yeah. what's happening in reality. Because like they can all be refined down to like what one would be the best, I guess, eventually. Because like they all iterate what's the best of each one. They could, but they're not. Yeah. So what's the difference? I know that's why. <laughs> uh, the difference is I think the difference is people. So the different teams, the different business relationships, the different. Uh, I mean, anybody can say anything, um, but in, in business, you you build up relationships and a track record of repeated trust over time that's built up. You can't build up trust just by saying things. You have to say, I'm going to do this, and then do it. I'm going to do this, and do it. And if you say, I'm going to do this, and then don't do it, and don't have a damn good reason for it, you lose a lot of trust in a hurry. And so it turns, because the cryptocurrency is a lot more complex than a simple economic model might predict. Probably why whenever I try to model if mining is going to make me money or not, I always come up with it's not going to make me money, but then I do it and it does. So, ride that while I can. <laughs> um, anything else? Yeah. So, these like machines, they like find the numbers that solve the like, challenges, yeah. you say. So, did they, are they also programmed to then like apply that to a block and like to add in the block to pay the miner and then post that to the ledger? Like, do they do that all at once? Um, so the mining machines typically don't do that mm -hmm. until, unless the cryptocurrency is very new and you're running your mining machine on a full node of it. So most of the mining machines that I run join a pool and a lot of that stuff's done at the pool. So they're running a full node and they'll uh, aggregate the transactions. So for example, um, they'll say, okay, well, there's about 3,000 transactions we're going to aggregate into here, and then we're going to try this nonce. I didn't really, I had a hard time remembering the word nonce until I realized it stands for a number used once. So, 3,000 transactions, the previous uh, hash, a nonce, run it through, and then they find the solution, which is a block of transactions and stuff like that, and then running a full node, they'll send it out to everybody else. So the mining pools run the nodes that do that. So how does this interface with it? Well, they have another program called a stratum server, and so this connects to it, and the mining pool program has a whole block of different nonces they're gonna try, and they assign this machine some of the nonces with a set of transactions, and this just iterates through the different nonces with a set of transactions, and if it finds a solution, it sends it back up to the pool, and the pool does the work of then broadcasting that out to the rest of the network. Okay, so like everybody in the pool, or like all the machines in the pool are working on one, like, I guess. Yeah, they're working on one job. Okay. So, yeah, it, it's like, um, you know, if I had all y'all do uh, physical calculations, I'd say, okay, well, here's the 10 transactions we're going to use. You use 0 through 9, you use 11 through 19, and each of you guys run that through. And the first one to find an answer, raise your hand, let me know. Thanks, we'll put that in, we'll send it on to everybody else. Okay. It's and just done so really fast. The payment goes to the pool and then the pool distributes that out? Exactly. Okay. And the way the pool distributes it is different. So some of them are, okay, how much work did each miner do in this block? Or how much did work did each miner do in the last three blocks? There's different ways of distributing the funds. Um, and in fact, to prevent pool hopping, you know, sometimes miners have really sophisticated applications. They'll say, okay, when did the block happen? All right, the block just happened, we're going to jump into this pool, we're going to get the credit for the next block, where they'll say, the block happened a minute ago, now it's been a minute, we're going to jump in and try to find it and get credit, and then we'll jump out of that pool, and, and then the mining pool operators come up with software to prevent pool hopping. There's, it, it gets complicated. Okay. Yeah. I don't deal with that. I just run the programs and I keep the equipment up and running. And I, I learn this stuff once and it makes sense, and then I just, I, I can go for like a week vacation and just let it run. So that's All right.
no more questions, I'll be here for a little bit if y'all have specific questions, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.